Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Today's the day. We're actually going to create the final iteration of the head transplant and fit it to this machine. And then I feel fairly comfortable that I should be able to release the drawings and all the data. We've been through quite a few iterations. We had, if you like, a series of my specially manufactured nozzle assemblies that plugged into this unit. Then we had the springy unit where I took a standard lens tube and modified it. But at the end of the day I had to ask myself the question why do I need to modify something that is standard and fairly cheap to buy? So I finally finished up developing a version of this which fits the standard lens tube and nozzle assembly. This will allow me to use a 20 millimeter lens from my light blade machine in this machine here, which previously had an 18 millimeter diameter lens in it. So I've now got a common lens assembly for both my machines. Now, that might not be too important to you, but I'm sure it's a great advantage to be able to use this type of lens assembly, which is much more flexible than the limited use for this small lens assembly. We'll talk about this later in a separate session or maybe we'll get time at the end to talk about this lens assembly. Because this is not completely useless, it's just limited. Now I delayed talking about this in the last session because there were one or two problems that I thought might occur because of the nozzle work that I did in the last session. I think that there were no negatives come out of that only a possible positive for the design that we're going to talk about today. So the first thing we're going to do is to use the old head to cut the new head. Uh, as I might have mentioned before, it's a bit like digging its own grave. This is, a two, this is the two inch gallium arsenide lens that I've got in here at the moment. And what I'm going to do before I start any work is to just find out where the correct focus point is. Now to determine the focus I always use my little dot test. It's the most accurate thing that I've found for determining the focus and you can get it to within half a millimeter. And what I normally do when I can't remember because I've been playing around with all these various lenses I've got no idea which lens is set to which dimension. If you've only got two lenses then it's very easy to remember the settings for each lens. So this is three millimeters, this, this space that I've got here. Okay, now we'll go up to three and a half millimetres. And then we'll go to four and a half millimetres. Now I'll just get my little magnifier out and I'll have a quick look at these to see which one is the best one. So three and a half and four are both about the same. So I'm going to use four millimetres. Now I've got some spaces here which are just pieces of acrylic. I'm just going to put these down, they're 5mm acrylic, just to lift the job off, lift the material off the bed. Just trying to find the right sort of speed that's going to work. Now the reason I'm lifting it up by a very small amount, relatively speaking, is I can still get air underneath the job, but when the pieces fall, I don't want them to fall down and out of position. If they fall a long way, they could fall out of position and they'll overlap with the next cut. I just want them to drop cleanly down, straight down. 70, I'm going to throw 60 watts at this very thin material, but I want to run it quite fast. So 60 watts, 25 millimetres a second, maybe even 30 millimetres a second. Just not.
Now we've got all these pieces here and I think to make life easy the best thing to do is to reduce the number by putting the ones that look like each other on top of each other. Now we've got these two here with slots in. There we go. And then we've got these here which have got tabs on and tabs on. They all look the same so we put those together in a pile. Then we've got that one which is on its own and then these here with two holes in which look as though they should all go together as well. So there we go, we've reduced this whole assembly now down to one, two, three, four, five, seven piles. Now where do we start? Well I think what we ought to do is to make sure that we check that some of these pieces actually fit together before we try and glue them into the assembly. That will be, that's going to pass the thread through it, but once the thread is through it, it's going to seem quite loose. So make sure that the thread passes through that hole reasonably snugly. Test number two is to make sure that this part of your lens tube fits reasonably snugly in there. Maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 clearance or something like that. But it definitely is not a tight fit, it's a slide fit through it. Okay, so that's two key issues sorted. The next one is to make sure that that allows this to go in and again it's a reasonable fit but not a perfectly snug fit. So now we ought to make sure that our nuts actually fit into the holes that I've made. So there's an M4 nut and it should fit smoothly into that hole there. And then the M3 nuts should fit into these holes here. They don't want to be any tighter than that. If you make them too tight you'll crack because there's such a thin wall here you'll actually crack the acrylic. Okay now we're going to build this little assembly up and the first thing we're going to do is pick these two back plates up and the one with the tongues on it is going to be in front of the one without the tongues on it. And what we're going to do we're going to have the holes set at two o'clock and seven o'clock. Now that's quite important because we're going to pick this one up we're going to plug this one onto, the, onto here, like this. Now we can hold on to this tag at the back here. And we can plug the other one in. Now if we lay it down on its back, we can carry out a very simple check to make sure that we've got it the right way. First of all, we need to make sure that the tongues are on the inside. And secondly, we need to make sure that when we look at it this way, the holes are at 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock. So now we've assembled this the right way. We can now pick this up holding it with our finger and thumb and look it causes the sides to push in but we can push those sides out and we can slip this little piece here over these tongues at the back and into the clips at the side like that. So now we've put some stability into the unit. So we can hold it there and we've got these two base plates here. What we need to do is to put those down, it doesn't matter which way we put them down other than the fact that the big hole has got to go on top of the small hole. And then we rotate these round so that we can sit this into it. So that's sitting in there now. Now what we've got to do is to, we're nearly there, we've got to organise these three plates here now. Two of these plates have got hexagonal holes in them. They've all got a little dink along the bottom edge. So first of all we can put those two together because there's no argument there. We'll turn this little notch to the bottom here and we'll rotate this one as well and we'll soon find out whether we've got this the right way because the holes won't line up. Probably hold it like that top and bottom with your finger on that notch. Hold this one with your finger and thumb and we're going to try and slide this into here like that. Clip. And there we go. That's it. Fully assembled. Well 99% assembled. But these pieces are going to fall off when we come to try and assemble it so we're not going to bother to put these pieces on till the last minute. Here, here's where you could really do with about six pairs of hands to hold all this together look because I'm holding the bottom on with my little finger and the sides together to clip it all together. 
because what we're now going to do is to put some glue on here to sort of tack it together. I think probably we might start at this middle tang here. We'll just see if we can put a little bit of glue in there on either side of the tang. And you can see it running in the joint. And we just hold the back on tight like that for about 20 or 30 seconds. While we've got this held together here, we'll also put a little teeny weeny bit of glue on this little side tongue here. Now these two little tongues at the back here, what we can do, we can lay it on its back and we can pop a couple of little bits of glue just along, along the back here. Now we should be able to put that down and from the inside just apply a little teeny weeny bit of pressure inside here towards the back just to hold those down. Now the only other thing that's going to fall out at the moment is the bottom. The bottom is not secured on. So what we'll do is turn this upside down and we'll put some blobs of glue around these tongues at the bottom here. And you can see that as we put the glue in here, it's running in between these plates here at the bottom as well. So very carefully, so you don't get your fingers stuck to the job, clamp it where there's no glue. Okay, well that's not gonna fall apart now. So the only other loose piece that we've got on here at the moment is this piece here at the top. And what we'll do, we'll, again, we'll hold this top and bottom and we'll try and flood this area here because we've got three sheets here. So we'll try and flood this area with some glue to get it down between the plates and into the joint. With a piece of tissue, as soon as I've done that, I'll wipe off the excess. We just clamp it all together. We can clamp it this way as well. These hexagons need to line up with these holes. So they will just fit on there like that. But before we put them on, what I'm going to do is put some glue on this surface so that we get a good strong bond here when we put this together. And then while we're doing that, we can put some glue on this one, put it on the right way. Okay, well that's the major assembly complete now, but what we've got to do is solidify it. We've got to make it strong now, and to make it strong, what we're going to do, we're going to run along all of the joints with some glue. You can see the glue flooding into the joints as you go around them. And I'm going to do them inside and out. Right, now while we're waiting for that to dry, this is the mirror holder and it needs to be assembled in a certain order. So we'll take the one with the three hexagon holes in and we'll lay that down so that the square slot is at the top and the we've got here an L, a backward L shape. Or the notch is on the bottom right hand corner. Now next we're going to put these two um, holes in which have got slots at the top. They're both the same and they will line up with the holes on here and the notch along the bottom edge. So we've got a backward L shape again. And then finally on top we can put this last one which again just make sure we get the notch and the backward L shape. Now we've got to turn this into one solid lump. But the way that we should do that is by holding them together like this so that the edges are level and the top and the bottom are level because we've got them down on this bottom surface here. So I'm going to flood the top edge with glue and the glue will go down between the plates and then I'm going to try and hold it together without getting my fingers stuck. Okay, and then we'll lift it up and we'll push the whole thing together. Now just for a few seconds, you can put it down and you can square the whole thing up because the plates will slip relative to each other. But after about 15 or 20 seconds, 
that opportunity will be lost. That really is all the assembly work done. We can see that this lens tube sits snugly in the bottom here and should rotate freely. It just sits flush more or less with the top here. And then this nozzle should screw in the bottom like this and clamp the whole thing together. Okay. And as we clamp these two pieces together, we're locking this onto this piece of two millimeter acrylic at the bottom. So it's holding everything steady. It's central this way, it's central that way, and it's held in line this way because it's pressed against the back edge and held in place with this U-shape. So this is a snug fit in here. Now you may remember on the previous head, for various parts of this, I was using a tap to tap various holes. I did an M3 tap and an M4 tap. Well, knowing that some of you guys won't have that equipment, I've purposely redesigned this to get rid of all the special skill equipment that you might need. Now, I mean, there's plenty of engineers amongst you that will have this equipment, but there's also a lot of you that won't have. So that's what I've been very mindful of as I've been designing this Mark IIa. So what we're doing here is we're dropping nuts into these hexagon holes like that. And I'll just put my fingers over them. And then we're going to put a small screw through from this side with an Allen key. Right. You'll feel it go tight. It needs to be snug. Don't actually sort of put your whole weight on it. We've now got two studs sticking out the back this time and the studs will pass through the bracket like that. So instead of putting screws into, into here, we're having studs coming out the back. Okay, now you might need one of these, or this is probably the best thing you can have, something like this, a little, um, a little socket. It's a, it's a five millimeter socket, I believe. No, it's a seven millimeter socket um, for suitable for an M4 nut. So we'll put a washer on each one of these. And then we've got a dome, a little acorn nut, as they call them. So everything there is easy and doable for most people, even if you have to use a little teeny weeny ring spanner or something. Right, well this time, to clamp the mirror in, we're going to use an M, just one single M4 grub screw, because we've got three point clamping again, one, two, three, but what we're going to do, we're going to drop a nut in there, an M4 nut in that slot, and then we can put the grub screw through. And here's one of my old copper mirrors, which we'll need to drop in there, and we drop it in from the back, and it just clamps in there with this one screw. Okay, now down in this bottom corner, we're going to put the nut in there, and from the back, you're going to screw in the button head screw. Again, it doesn't need to be too tight, that's just a pivot point on which the mirror is going to pivot. With these grub screws, from the pointy end, we're going to put a nut on the pointy bit. And you're going to drop that into this hexagon hole here so that it comes through this side. And once it's through this side, you're gonna put a nut on it. Now we're gonna take the nut off later, but we just need the nut on there at the moment to stop it from falling out. So it's an assembly aid. Do the same thing in the other corner. So to put these M3 screws in, it may be easy, as a little trick here, if you put the nut on the end of a screw, like that, and then you can easily jiggle it into the hole. Okay, now the chances are those nuts won't come out because they're snug fit. We've got a couple of springs. We're going to offer the mirror up inside there, like that. And we've got a M3 by 25 long screw that goes in adjacent to that nut. And it should pass through the hole and 
if you put a little bit of compression on the spring it should start to bite in the nut and it just comes through to the other side of the nut that's all you want now we should be able to remove this nut because the nut is captivated in there now look, you can tighten up the nut and it brings this it adjusts the mirror okay so it's good to have the mirror square like that <clears throat> before you put the second one in. We could probably take that one off now while it's easy because it's not going to fall out the other side because it's captivated by the mirror. It just makes putting the spring in easier. So again you have to press on the spring and there we go. So we set these level basically So that we get a nice even gap of about one and a half millimetres all the way round. And there we are. That's a head assembly done with no special tools. And if you want to remove your mirror at any time, you only need to undo this one grub screw on the front here, like this. And the mirror should just pop out the back. I've made a batch of 25 of these brackets. And I've been out and bought a batch of screws, springs, etc. More than is required for 25. But I had to do that to get them at a reasonable discount price. Even so, these springs were nearly a pound each. So, in terms of just the fixings and fittings in here, we're probably talking about three, three or four pounds. And the manufacturer of the bracket, with its welding and laser cutting, even as a batch of 25, they cost me almost £10 a set. Just for the material alone in this head, we're talking something in the region of about £15. I know what it costs to ship stuff around the world because I do it with the doohickey. This is slightly heavier, and I suspect that I could ship this anywhere in the world for about £5 by ordinary mail. So that's the total price for this kit of around about £20. As I said to you guys before, I'm retired, I prepared well for my retirement, I married a rich woman and I just spend her money. So I don't need to make a profit on these things, I'm just doing this because it'll help some of you guys to modify your machines and make them so much better. This is a kit that's designed specifically for the China Blue machine with its front mounting bracket. The design is freely available for anybody that wants to attempt to do the same sort of thing but adapt a bracket to suit their top mounted um, red sail clone type machine. They're not all exactly the same so you'd have to look at your own machine and decide how you could mount a head like this. One other thing to remember is if you're going to adapt this for another machine is this does not adjust. You have to have an adjustable table. One of the great things I like about the modifications I've done to this machine, especially this steel plate that I've got in the bottom here, all I've got to do is drop my table down a little bit and I can clear all the rubbish off just like that. And because I've been cutting um, acrylic on there, there's a possibility that I've got some sticky residue on there. So all I've got to do is literally just a, a, quick, a quick wipe over with some acetone and we're back in working order. To make life easier for myself when I put this head on here I needed to make my table adjustable very very easily and on the side of my machine round here I've got a switch, a three position switch which allows me to send the table up, off or down. Now that's a very inconvenient way of adjusting the table height. So what I've done, I've paralleled up a couple of switches on the front here so that I can get very small, quick adjustments for setting the focus height. Well, I shall just turn the power off to make absolutely sure the machine is safe before I work on it. Now I'm not going to replace this bracket because, you know, it's already fixed in place.
Right, we've turned the machine back on. Now we can start setting up the Z axis again because this head has obviously needs to be reset. But it's the easiest job in the world because first of all, I didn't show you how to make this very simple setup tool, but I don't think you need instructions to do that. Um, one important point is it's got a little um, dimple in the top here, purposely, so that when I put one of my targets in, you push it in and it clips in so that it doesn't fall out. Now we can just pop that in there like that and hopefully we're not going to be too far out. Now I'm going to set the power down to 15% and because we know that this was approximately correct a few minutes ago before we took the head off we should find that we get our burn mark somewhere in that target. Yeah. Now we don't have to be too worried about this because remember this is an approximate setup. Our main Z setup is when we come to align the Z axis in that plane. But we need it approximately right here. So we'll we'll set it up so that is I can just loosen these nuts off by hand now, which is great. So we'll move that across a bit. Just test it again. And now it's got to go down a little bit. And just to be sure, we push our target out from the back and we just pop another one in. Now I will show you how to make these targets and I'll provide you with a, uh, a pattern for making the targets. So that's near enough on centre to not worry too much more about. So now I'm going to use this target holder again, just because it's convenient, um, and we'll pop another target in there. And we'll pop that down on the table. And we'll raise the table up as high as we can reasonably get it. Very crudely, I can line this up by eye, just approximate, because all we're trying to do is put two burn marks on here. We don't care whether they're on centre or not. So we'll put our first pulse mark down. We've got a burn mark on there. It's a bit of a strange burn mark. But that's because I'm an absolute idiot. Let's have a serious laugh at my senility, should we? What haven't I done? <laughs> Look, it's a blank mirror, not a real one. But it does just show you how effective copper, even in its crappy state, is at transmitting energy. And reflecting. Okay, so let's put my proper copper mirror back in there, shall we? I don't want to put my fingers on this. We'll just pop that under there anywhere and we do a pulse. <laughs> and there we go. Now that looks like a real pulse. <laughs> now we'll drop the table down. There we go, that's about four inches down now. Now we'll check, see where the pulse is. Not bad considering I haven't even set this up. So now we need to work out what we've got to do. We can tweak. Well, first of all, we've got to bend the mirror forward at the top. So we'll go to the front edge and we'll tip the mirror forward a little bit. Pulse, too much, back a shade. Not bad. Now we've got to go slightly to the left. And I think we're probably not far off now, so let's go back and try another target. And we've got to go back and repeat the whole process again. As I said, it really doesn't matter how well aligned that target is. It just doesn't matter. We'll just do a pulse, and then we'll drop this table down. The only thing we're trying to achieve with this test is two burn marks that completely coincide. The further they are away, the more accurate your Z setting. Pulse. It looks pretty good. Maybe very slightly, if I want to be really fussy, I could probably come slightly left, which means I've got to tip the mirror that way, which means I've got to let the mirror off just a shade. I'm not going to change that. That's perfectly okay. So we've got the beam running perpendicular to the table now. The only thing left to do 
is to make sure that the beam is running right down the axis of the lens. And we can do that by putting our target right in the bottom there and we do a pulse to see where we are. The answer is it's not running through the axis of the lens. So what we've got to do now is adjust it. And this is where things could get a little bit confusing. So what you have to look at is how this is reflecting off of this mirror at the top here. At the moment it's forward of the center line which means that it's hitting the mirror too high and it's bouncing down early before we get to the center point. So if it's bouncing off the top of the mirror too early what we need to do is to move the mirror up so that it goes much closer to the center of the mirror. So the first thing we're going to do is to play with the Z axis and we'll just raise the Z axis up by a little bit. Well that's not bad but it's not quite spot on. So it's very easy to take this out now and just chuck another one in if you've got any doubts at all. No, nope. we can go up a little bit further. And there we go, look, we're absolutely spot on now. So the only thing we've got to do now, which is the easy bit, is to move the head backwards and forwards. And we can do that very simply. Here we can still possibly, let's just make sure the circle is completely round. It could go up just a little bit more. See, the thing is, with this, we can get it absolutely spot on. We haven't got to spend ages fiddling around with the position of the tube. Bing! There we go. 10 minutes and we've got the machine perfectly set up in Z. You saw my stupidity with that mirror. What I meant to say was, you'll note that I've put the copper mirrors back into this machine. Here we are two years down the road after I made these mirrors and they're still working perfectly. Yes, I've had to just occasionally, this one in particular, polish it. But it's only been like a 10 second polish. It's nothing. You can't clean these with isopropyl alcohol because they tarnish. Um, because they're not protected by anything. But the amount of tarnishing takes place very, very slowly over quite a long period. So I've still got my molly mirrors in the background ready to replace these if ever I need to. We've got our head retransplant complete now. Um, what I'm going to do is to close the lid on that temporarily and we're going to talk about the great new world that has just opened to you guys with a China Blue machine. Well, here was your previous China Blue lens and nozzle world. You were probably supplied with a two inch lens which is what this configuration is here, K. And that probably worked quite well while you had the 30 watt tube that you were supplied with. But if like me, you upgraded to a 60 or 70 watt or even an 80 watt tube, you would have probably found that without knowing it, that we were causing the beam to get interference with the end of this nozzle. With a one and a half inch lens, which is, to be honest, what my little machine here was supplied with from square one. It was an amazing piece of kit. And look, it goes right cleanly through to the middle of this nozzle without any interference at all. And I was ecstatic with the lens and the performance that I had. That was the only thing that I could do. I could have a two inch or one and a half inch lens. Now, the problem with the one and a half inch lens is that it is too close to the work when it comes to engraving. You really need to be close to the work and focusing your air assist down into the kerf when you are cutting. But when you're engraving, the last thing you want to do is to blow the smoke back onto your work. And so consequently, you really need to have a long distance between the nozzle and your focus point. So a two inch lens would seem to be perfect for engraving. Well, that's not true because a two inch lens has got a big spot size and you can't do very fine engraving with a two inch lens. It's only as I moved further and further into this technology that I completely understood this opposite requirements of engraving and cutting. 
Moving away from the limitations of what we've got here is like opening up the door to a whole new world. And so let's examine what we could do. Now I used these diagrams in the last session to show you what the limitations and what the problems were with various configurations. As I cautioned at that point in time, I don't necessarily think that going ahead and opening all these nozzles up to allow the beam to pass through is the best thing. It may well be that we need the occlusion that's supplied with some of these configurations to give us good performance for cutting. Now if you look at the text that accompanies this video then I will include in there a couple of places, a couple of forums where you can go to download the drawings with all the data for the screws and the dimensions for the bracket where you'll be able to download that information without bothering me at all. There will also be information on there about where you can get these various lens and nozzle configurations from. But if you need to purchase a set of screws um, and a bracket, then you may as well come directly to me and I will provide you with all of that data pack. Now sadly, YouTube have killed their personal messaging system just recently. So there is no easy way that you can pass your email address to me so that I can send you a data pack. The only way that we can do that now is if you add a comment with your email address in it, what I can do is immediately delete that comment. I get a copy of that comment on my Gmail. So your address will not be lost, but it won't be exposed to public view. So that way I can write back to you with a data pack and a PayPal request. And one of the things in that data pack would be this set of pictures here of the various nozzle configurations. Because we've got a whole new world open to us now. Basically, if you use a long nozzle like this with various lens configurations, and we've got a four inch lens, a two and a half inch lens, a two inch lens, and even a one and a half inch lens with a stubby nozzle. You can, you can cut with all of these lenses because they've all got a very short distance between the nozzle and the focal point. Now, when it comes to engraving, I would earnestly recommend that you choose a nozzle like this, a short nozzle, so that you've got a long distance between your focal point and the nozzle itself. What happens is when you engrave, every time you fire the laser at your engraving, you produce a little volcanic eruption of smoke that fires upwards. Now, what you don't want is that little volcanic eruption to try and find its way into your nozzle. It might not find its way into your nozzle, but things like wood have got a horrible gungy smoke. And what will happen is that gungy smoke will build up on the outside of your nozzle here. And it will actually build up on the face of the nozzle as well. And may actually come down and paint the surface of your work with brown gunk. So it's not advisable to use this for engraving. This is the approach that you should take for engraving. A long distance between the nozzle and the focal point. And that world has been opened up to you with these short nozzles that will fit onto these tubes. Now, at the moment, when you buy a short nozzle, it looks like this, because it's been designed for the one and a half inch lens to fit into a two inch lens holder. Now, let me explain this. There are two types of lens holder that you can buy. And if we look carefully, in there, you can probably see that this one, the shoulder, is here, and this one, the shoulder, is right back down inside. This is designed to sit a two inch lens on this ledge here, and this one is designed to sit a two and a half inch lens on the ledge at the back there. So these are designed specifically for certain types of focal length lens. Yeah, okay, I hear what you say, the rules don't apply to me. Also, in the back of these nozzles, you'll see that they've got a thread as well, which means if you really want to, you could put a four inch lens in the back, right up here. Okay, which is why this is a very flexible system. 
you certainly couldn't put a four inch lens in this nozzle here. Now, as I said just now, this nozzle is designed to go in here with a one and a half inch lens. But what I'd much prefer to do is to say that we do something like this, which is we punch an eight millimeter hole in the end of that nozzle and then it all of a sudden becomes an engraving nozzle. Now, it doesn't have to be an eight millimeter hole, but if you're using a one and a half inch lens for engraving, then it just about passes through an eight millimeter hole. We haven't yet done that work to prove whether or not for a, an engraving lens, the engraving will be better if we put an occlusion and we limit the power that comes out of the nozzle. The only problem with leaving some of the power to heat up the nozzle, all we're trying to achieve with our airflow is to prevent fumes from coming up and coating the face of the lens. We're not getting very much airflow to drag any heat away if we are heating the nozzle up. The jury is still out on this one at the moment. I've got to do a lot more work on nozzles. But hey, look, these nozzles have been around since the flood and nobody's complained about them so far. They can stay like they are until those discoveries are made and then we can make the necessary modifications ourselves. Now the only problem with all of this is that if you've got a machine like this, it only takes 18 millimeter lens assembly. And if you've got three or four, they're no longer going to be useful to you. Not entirely true, because first of all, you can use your old nozzle on this new head. So you don't have to necessarily go out and buy a whole new set of lenses. You'll be limited in what you can do to what you've previously been able to do, but nothing has been taken away from you. It's just that there's a much bigger opportunity available if you want to spend some money on lenses in the future. To cater for this particular situation where you have got 18 millimeter lenses already, you will be able to buy a standard long nozzle like this with a little location ring in the back already pre-machined for you on both the long and the short nozzle. So that you can, if necessary, mount your 18 millimeter lens in here. Now it does, that does mean to say that you're not going to be using this lens in the normal way that it was designed to go into that tube. Now here I've got an old 18 millimeter lens. This is the lens that I damaged when I tried to use it with stainless steel engraving. It's got the, um, it's got the coating burnt off the bottom and it's cracked in the middle. I'm going to be using this lens for demonstration purposes only. So how can we use this 18 millimeter lens in this new tube system? As I said, the rules are meant to be broken. And although this particular item in here is meant to be a lens clamp ring, there's nothing in the universe that tells me that I can't use that as a backstop. And if I set that to a position in there that's just right, and I put an O-ring on it, when I set my O-ring in there to a certain depth and I screw this on the top, if I get it right, which I haven't done, that is screwed down hard and I felt no resistance at all. So I've got that dimension wrong in there. So I take the O-ring out and I wind the ring forward a couple of turns and put the O-ring back and screw it on top. And now, look, I can feel the O-ring starting to bite just there, and it's clamped the lens in. So what I've done here, I've created option J. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that option J is exactly what I've done. I've got the clamp ring on top, an O-ring underneath, a lens underneath that, and then the nozzle. Now, equally well, I can do the same thing with the short nozzle. If you've got this sort of 24 millimeter diameter stem system on your machine already, then you can already play this trick with a one and a half inch lens because I very much doubt whether you'll have a one and a half inch lens on your system. But when it comes to this system, we've got to be a little bit careful, which is why we can again, we can still use this technique, but what we've got to remember here is when I tighten this up like this, I'm actually clamping on a piece of two millimeter thick acrylic here. That 
two millimeter flange on the bottom here sits between the nozzle and the lens tube. So I've added two millimeters to the length of the nozzle. Or conversely, you could say that I've pushed the nozzle two millimeters further forward towards the work and reduced the distance between the focal point and the nozzle. That's why I said I was a little bit cautious about what I was going to find in the last session and I wondered whether it would affect what we were doing here. It doesn't affect what we're doing here. If anything, it helps it because it pushes the nozzle a little bit further forward towards the sharper bit of the beam. So there's less obstruction of the beam as it passes through the nozzle. But what it does mean is when I'm setting up this O-ring in here, I've got to set it up so that I cater for two things. So when you're trying to set up this sort of arrangement in here, you have to be a little bit more careful because what you've got to do is play with this ring in here, the backstop. So now that I've got this set, I can feel that the O-ring is biting on the lens just there, but it's still loose on there. I can tighten it up just a shade more and I'm now clamping both the lens and the lens tube onto the head here. So everything is nice and solid. So I said you've got to be a little bit inventive, a little bit creative with the way in which you can use these lenses. Now there is another way that you can play with these lenses. Now as I said although they've got two inch bodies and two and a half inch bodies my personal recommendation is that you always buy a two and a half inch with two clamp rings. Why? Well, very simple really. You can use one as a backstop and one as a clamp. If I put a two inch lens in a two and a half inch lens holder, I've got the ability to push the lens forward or draw it back and adjust this distance here. Now, you can say, well, what good is that? Well, it could be very useful to you because if, for example, you don't want to remember other than I've got a six millimeter gap for cutting and a 15 millimeter gap for engraving, you can, you can buy two or three, you can buy a lens holder and nozzle for every lens that you've got and you can set them up to exactly the same distance by adjusting the lens inside the tube. Whereas at the moment, because the lens has got a fixed backstop, you have no option. So, my recommendation is that you purchase two or three lens tubes and leave your lenses in those tubes. Don't keep swapping your lenses over. That way you can have everything preset. Now, as I mentioned last time to you, if you've got a job where you need to engrave and then cut, this is not a very clean option. This is not a very clean option either. This cuts well, will engrave, but will clog up your nozzle. This one engraves well, it will leave horrible brown marks when you cut it. This is not for cutting really, and this is not for engraving. But if I had a choice, I've got to do my engraving and cutting with these lenses but keep an eye on the end of the nozzle and keep it clean. There isn't, really isn't a compromise to produce a, a universal nozzle. The requirements are so different. Cutting and engraving, as I've mentioned to you many times through these sessions is, you must have a cross flow of air through, through your work. I think most people know by now that I am 99% against honeycomb tables. But for almost two years, my light blade honeycomb table has been standing beside the machine. You cannot get cross flow with a honeycomb table. You get down flow. And that's the last thing you want when you're trying to clear the debris away from engraving. You need a cross flow of air, which is why I've got solid steel base plates on both my machines. Even with cutting, the smoke that goes downwards it doesn't go cleanly away. It settles and condenses in the little cells of the table. You might think that there's a downflow, but if you think about it, there is no downflow through a piece of solid material that's sitting on top of a hole. You've only got the merest little gap for the air to flow through and go down underneath your honeycomb table. So even with 
cutting. You need cross flow, but you lift your work off the table to get the cross flow underneath the job this time, not across the top of the job. So the one thing that these machines do not have as part of their fundamental design is air flow management. Where does the air get into this machine? There is nowhere for the air to go in. Apart from the holes, the gaps around the edge of the panels, I've got a vacuum cabinet there. There is no flow through that work area. The only way that I get flow through that work area is by lifting the lid like that about an inch and a half to allow a nice jet of air to come in through the front and be sucked out at the back. So don't expect miracles just because, just because we're putting a new head on there. There are so many other things that you need to do to your machine to make it into a piece of efficient equipment. Now I've given you all the tools for doing that job today here. You've got a new head, you've got a new, look, a new nozzle and lens system. Just make sure that you also look at your air management. Not a lot more to be said today. We've covered a lot. A rehead transplant, the new world of lenses and lens tubes, and how you can make your machine work a lot better. Well, I think that's been a pretty all-encompassing session today. So until the next time, thanks for your time and we'll catch up with you in the next session.